Hi, my name is Lennox, and I'm going to be talking to you about prison libraries as well as library service to inmates. So I'm going to start with a brief history of prison libraries. And before I do, it's really important to keep in mind uh, a couple questions um, as I go through this history. The first of which is, is reading a privilege or a fundamental human right? And what impact does educational programming have on inmates? Um, and the reason why these are important is because it has a lot of impact on service to inmates. And throughout time, as you'll see, we sort of flip-flop back and forth between uh, prisons as a place of punishment and prisons as a place of rehabilitation. So from 1780 to 1865, that's where prisons are really solidified as um, places for punishment. And there's an emphasis on isolation. These are people who are there to be punished, so they're segregated from the general population as well as each other. Um, and they're allowed to read the Bible, and that's it. Um, in 1870, what's known as the progressive period starts, and there's sort of a focus on prison reform. Um, it's important to know that it's, by our standards, still not that progressive, but uh, inmates are now allowed to read uh, moral and religious materials um, and librarians at that time are essentially clergy members. And uh, the reason this is important is there's the shift um, from the belief that uh, criminals are inherently criminals to the idea that um, criminals can be rehabilitated and can re-enter society after they're done serving their time in prison. So after widespread prison violence, uh, there's an increased focus on rehabilitation in the 1950s. It's when the American Prison Association becomes the American Correctional Association, and it's what's known as the era of treatment. It's also when bibliotherapy becomes really popular, as well as when um, the, the idea of a prison library and a prison librarian start to gain a lot of respect. Um, it's important to note that prisoners' reading habits are still highly monitored. Um, they're given books that, quote-unquote, emphasize major values of our civilization and the philosophy implied in the Ten Commandments. And the works that they read are still highly censored. And anything thought to be too highbrow or too intellectual for prisoners is also kept out of the library, and they're not given access to it. Um, in, the 19, in 1971, Congress grants money to prisons and jails to establish service with local libraries. And throughout the 70s, um, prisoners start rioting, essentially, to protest general prison conditions, as well as the fact that prison libraries aren't providing relevant materials, or they're keeping materials that are thought to be too intellectual out of the library. So, for example... Um, prisoners at New York City's Tombs Jail destroyed 4,500 volumes to protest the conditions in the library. And then after this widespread violence, once again, um, there's a shift back the other way, where rehab rehabilitation is seen as futile, and once again, prisons are a place of punishment. And as prisons start to experience budget cuts, the libraries are kind of the first thing to go. And this is also when um, the ALA and the American Correctional Association sort of experience a fundamental shift in ideologies and split. Um, before this, they'd been working together and sort of um, writing materials about service to inmates since the 1930s. Um, and this is where that all ends. So since the beginning of the 1980s, um, prisoners' opportunities for reading, education, and rehabilitation steadily decline. But in 2006, there's a really important court case that severely limits prisoners' rights to access information. Um, the Supreme Court declared it constitutional for a Pennsylvania prison to deny secular newspapers, magazines, and photographs to its quote-unquote most incorrigible and recalcitrant male prisoners. So at the time, it was about 40 male prisoners who were in the long-term segregation unit of this prison, um, which means they're there for a minimum of 90 days, 
They're confined to their cell for 23 hours a day without access to a radio, television, or a telephone, except in cases of emergency. So these prisoners are still allowed religious and legal materials, legal and personal correspondence, two library books, and paper to write on. And after this decision, Justice Stevens and Justice Ginsburg officially dissented, um, both arguing that this strikes at fundamental uh, First Amendment rights. Um, and Justice Stevens specifically cited the 1965 Griswold First Connecticut court case um, in which the Supreme Court declared, quote, the state may not contract the spectrum of available knowledge. The right of freedom of speech and press includes not only the right to utter or print, but the right to distribute, the right to receive, the right to read, and freedom of inquiry. Um, and then Stevens also sort of gave a slippery slope argument. Um, he argued that um, justifying any regulation that deprives a prisoner of constitutional rights um, as long as the prisoner can theoretically regain that right after they modify their behavior. Really, really dangerous. Um, and then Ruth Bader Ginsburg also um, pointed out sort of how arbitrary the rule is. So prisoners, for example, can read the Jewish Daily Forward, but not the Christian Science Monitor. Um, they could read Harlequin romance novels, but they weren't allowed to keep up to date with uh, what was going on in the Iraq war. And she also pointed it out that um, the stated purpose of the long-term segregation unit at the prison was essentially to rehabilitate the prisoners. Um, but this court case portrayed them as so incredibly dangerous um, that essentially they'd never become productive members of society. Um, So inmates do give up some of their rights when they enter prison, such as the right to privacy, um, but they do not give up their First Amendment rights so long as they don't interfere with the uh, objectives of the correctional institution they're at. This is why prisons can open the mail of prisoners. But it's important to know that not everyone agrees that the right to read uh, is protected by the First Amendment. Um, the American Library Association does support the prisoner's right to read. They argue that participation in a democratic society requires access to current social, political, economic, cultural, scientific, and religious information. And I really liked this quote from their page, to, um, their page on service to inmates that says, when free people, through judicial procedure, segregate some of their own, they incur the responsibility to provide humane treatment and essential rights. Among these is the right to read. The right to choose what to read is deeply important, and the suppression of ideas is fatal to a democratic society. The denial of the right to read, to write, and to think, to intellectual freedom, diminishes the human spirit of those segregated from society. And even if you don't necessarily agree with the ALA, prisoner's right to read is um, protected by the First Amendment. Uh, information availability is essential to a prisoner's successful transition to freedom. So it's been proven that education reduces recidivism. So prisoners who participate in educational programming are less likely to re-enter prison. Um, pr prisoners who participate in GED classes and job training are less likely to re-enter prison. And even prisoners who access, who have access to works of fiction in their library, it's been shown that uh, fiction helps these prisoners understand themselves and their actions in a greater context. Um, so all of these things work together to keep prisoners from re-entering prison, which in the long run saves the government money, essentially. So even if you don't agree that they have the right to read, it's still, you should still support um, their access to educational programming, their access to information within the library system.
So who are these people in prison? Uh, nearly 1.5 million people were in prison in 2012. And in 2011, the United States had the highest incarceration rate in the world. Uh, in 2012, 32% of inmates were black, 35% were white, 21% were Hispanic. Um, so as you can see, minorities are disproportionately incarcerated. Uh, in 2011, 40% of the people incarcerated were convicted of nonviolent drug, property, or public order crimes. 8% of people in prison are women, and that number is growing, um, and it's really skyrocketed since the beginning of the war on drugs. Women are much more likely to go to prison for violent drug um, crimes, and it's important to note that only about 25% of women are in prison for violent crimes. Uh, and because they are a minority within the prison system, they face a lot of unique issues themselves. Um, there's also a growing elderly population as people are receiving longer and longer sentences and are less likely to get parole. People are, people are aging in the system. Um, 50 to 60 percent of inmates have not finished high school and inmates also suffer from high rates of substance abuse and mental illness. So as you can see, uh, there are a lot of very, very, very diverse needs, which means that um, a diverse prison library and access to information is really important for this population. So prison library and service inmates really varies a lot from state to state and even um, from correctional institution to correctional institution. Uh, by law, Prisons have to provide access to a person trained in the law or to a law library. And most facilities opt for the law library instead of hiring paralegals. So that's the bare minimum that they have to provide. Um, but some prisons really go above and beyond with the services that they offer to inmates. Um, Family literacy programs are starting to become more popular, and there's a really great family literacy program in Wisconsin. And this is important because it allows inmates to maintain relationships with their families, um, which is another way that helps prisoners really reintegrate with society once they get out of prison. Um, if they have a relationship with their family, they have a place to go, they have a support system in place. Um, and it's also important because there's really a focus on this idea of punishing the inmate, um, and we kind of forget the other people who are punished by this incarceration, um, which is that inmate's family, who are not necessarily guilty of anything, but are punished nonetheless. And so the Breaking Barriers with Books program um, is offered by Oshkosh Correctional Institution. It allows the inmate to take a class on child development where they learn how to pick out age-appropriate materials, how to read aloud, how to write poems for their children, and sort of things like that. And then they're given extra time um, to visit with their children and to read to them. And then if their children do not live in the area, they can film themselves and then send a video um, of them reading to their children. Um, which is a really great service. Um, some prison libraries will offer literature classes. So a U of A professor was teaching poetry workshops um, at a prison in Arizona and then publishing the works of inmates and um, past inmates in the Walking Rain Review. And um, the University of Arizona Poetry Center um, helped fund this. The last Walking Rain review was published in 2009, and then it stopped, and I wasn't able to find out exactly what happened to it or if these workshops are still going on, but maybe Sarah knows something about that. Um, another really great literature program is um, Shakespeare in Shackles, which is a program um, in Indiana. Um, it's a partnership between the Wabash Valley Correctional Facility and Indiana University where uh, an, um, excuse me, an English professor there 
teaches Shakespeare to inmates, and then they discuss it and rewrite plays and make them relevant to the inmates' lives. Um, and all of this sort of brings up how important community partnerships are. And a lot of prisons are starting to branch out. Um, and Colorado State is actually a really good example of a state where a lot of people are working together to provide services for inmates. So in Colorado, um, the Colorado Department of Education partnered with um, the Colorado Correctional Facilities there. And um, this includes the state library. Um, it gives prisoners access to more information through interlibrary loan. And it also, the library now provides a lot more services to the inmates. Um, so they've really maximized what they are able to do for inmates. So prison libraries face a lot of issues. Um, they don't necessarily have great budgets. They have to serve a large, very diverse population. And the libraries themselves are very small and finite. So it's pretty hard to make sure that all the information needs of every inmate are met. Um, so when I was trying to think of services that could be offered to inmates, um, I was really trying to maximize the amount of access to information that these prisoners had. And after reading about a few successful examples, it seemed like um, interlibrary loan systems would be the best bet. Um, Colorado, for example, is a state where um, the state, the public libraries there work with the state correctional facilities um, to provide as much access to the prisoners as possible. Um, and this ultimately enables greater service to more inmates, um, regardless of their individual goals. So um, people who are experiencing non-emergency health issues who can't necessarily get permission to go see a doctor can get information about their health. Um, people who are at prisons that do not provide programming specific to their needs can get information on substance abuse or sexual assault or, um, you know, GED information, whatever they may need. Um, this also works to serve the ALA's mission to serve inmates as well. And lastly, um, library budgets are based on census data. So if a prison is already in the same county as a library, the prisoners are counted where they're held. And so libraries are already taking into consideration these prisoners when they are budgeting for the year, essentially. Um, so it really makes sense that public libraries should reach out and ideally set up an interlibrary loan system with prisons. I have a few discussion questions for you guys. The first of which is, do you think that the right to read is protected by the First Amendment and that prisoners have the right to read? The second is, do you think an interlibrary loan system between public libraries and state prison libraries is realistic? And the third is, what do you think is the most important service that should be offered to inmates? Thank you guys for listening and I look forward to hearing your thoughts.